Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Back on Track advising session. We're here to answer all of your wonderful questions that you might have about your academics. And our presenters today are Mr. Jaime Carabajal and Ms. Debbie Pastini. So have your questions ready, get your warm drink handy, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Awesome. Um, so I'll begin uh, and introduce us in our presentation. But Jaime, do you want to go ahead and share the slides? Uh, yep, I'm doing that right now. Yay. He's much better with this stuff than me. <laughs> Okay, cool. So the name of our presentation um, and for this event is uh, Back on Track. And this is a good time for that, right? Um, fall semester, halfway through um, thinking about getting ready for spring. Um, and we put a quote on there because this is how we think about uh, things that we're going to talk about is really just um, looking at the long game, at the journey, not so much getting focused on you know, what's going on right now. Um, and so just to introduce us, um, Jaime is uh, going to share also. He, uh, we are both RPC coordinators. What that means is we are advisors and he's in the Division of Health Sciences Advising Center for any of you that have majors in the health sciences like pre-nursing, etc. And I am an advisor in the College of Liberal Arts, the Wilson Advising Center for majors like psychology, history, English, et cetera. So we may be some of your advisors and um, hopefully you'll come meet with us and get a little picture of what we do here. But um, we both have our own stories of why we're in advising and today we have plenty of time. So if you have questions about, you know, why are you here? Why are you an advisor? We can help you with that. But um, I know for myself, I also was a first generation college student. Um, my whole entire family, which is huge, big Mexican family all over Colorado. Um, college wasn't a focus of ours. And so I had to learn a lot of things, probably like all of you. And um, so hopefully I can share some things that will help you um, as we go through the presentation. We do have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, so keep, take notes, um, feel free to interrupt, you know, put your hand up or however um, you feel comfortable. But um, if you don't, by the end, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, and definitely, thank you all for attending. Uh, so as Debbie mentioned, I'm Jaime Carbajal. I'm the Retention, Progression, and Completion Coordinator for the Division of Health Sciences. Um, I too am first generation college student. I earned my bachelor's degree, master's, and currently I'm working on finishing up my PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and I did grow up in Southern New Mexico to a predominantly uh, Mexican family. So being first generation going to college and sharing the experiences is definitely one reason, especially why I am here, especially to help out with this presentation, because I was actually a person who was on academic probation and was able to rebound and continue and do well at school. So it's great to definitely share about our experiences, but we want to be able to help provide you more information and resources to help you along your journey. So one of the biggest elements that comes up is as far as what is academic probation. There's a lot of different things that you may hear as far as being here at UNLV that relates to academic probation. Um, ultimately, it is based on all of your UNLV grades that you earn at UNLV. If you've grades at other earned grades at other places like CSN or dual credit or anything like that, those are not included in your UNLV GPA. So it's a combination of all of the grades that you've earned at UNLV. Now, there are different types of them. So UNLV, the one you can see on your transcript and everything is your university GPA. So in order to stay in good standing at UNLV, you have to make sure that you're meeting that minimum cumulative GPA requirement of a 2.0. That is the base one that would determine whether or not you would go on to say UNLV probation. Uh, the other type of probation that does exist is called college probation. So that is based off of your major. So there are some majors within, like, say, the College of Engineering, the College of Education. If you're one of those majors, you may get placed on what's called your engineering probation or education probation based on the requirements that they have. That can range. So within the College of Education, as an example, they have a minimum of a 2.75, 
GPA that you need to stay in good standing. If you are below that, then you would go on to that college probation. And then the other part is your major minimum GPA requirement. So with us, um, what we require with health science majors, especially if they are like a pre-nursing major, you need to have a minimum of a 3.0 major GPA as a pre-nursing student to stay in good standing. Otherwise, with your major of pre-nursing, you'll go on to probation for that major. And it's important to kind of know the difference between all of these because we all know everyone throws out those different words and everything. Um, but it's important so that way you know kind of where you stand within all of these. So you could technically be in a good standing with your UNLV cumulative GPA, but then with your college or major, you may be on probation with them. So that is definitely a good starting point because the more you know, the more it can definitely help you with either being able to rebound, get back on track, or just stay in good standing. And a common question that we get, especially when it comes to being on probation, is will this lead me to getting suspended? Which is a good part. We kind of see that. We're like, oh, no, I'm on probation. What's going to happen next? Um, that is a good question. So UNLV's academic suspension comes from the registrar's office. What they go to look at is your academic suspension is based off of your UNLV GPA, based off of everything you've taken, and what's called your grade point balance. This lets you know how far above or below you are from the target GPA of a 2.0, or from your target GPA. So on the table to the right, you are able to go ahead and see that each grade is worth a certain amount of grade point balance points. So an A is worth two points, a B is worth one point, a C is worth zero points, a D is negative one, and an F is negative two. So if you continue to not do well in your classes, your GPA continues to stay low and you're not doing well with, you know, retaking classes, then it's possible that all of the addition of your grades and your grade point balance can lead you to have a negative 15 grade point balance. If that does happen, um, you'll get suspended from UNLV for an academic year. This includes fall and spring semesters, does not include the summer. Um, and then students with one semester at UNLV are exempt. So this means if this is your very first semester at UNLV, and you go on probation and you just don't do well, you're not gonna get suspended. It would only be after um, your second term, where if you have a below a negative 15 grade point balance, then you would get suspended. Now, there's a lot of efforts out there to go and help communicate with you if you were either close to being on probation, if you are on probation, or even if you are getting close to suspension. Your instructors reach out to you, academic advisors such as Debbie and myself, we reach out to you along with your majors to try and help you get back on track. There are resources, there are options and resources for support. So the more we can help, the better. So what is really good two questions to ask yourselves is, does your college have a suspension policy? So as far as if it's based on your major and your GPA, um, if they do, do you know what happens? Um, especially, do you have to end up changing your major? Um, do you have to go to like an exploring major and then decide it? That's a good question. It's definitely good to check with whatever college you're in, especially with your advising center to help determine that. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, so, so far, is everyone keeping up with some of the terminology a little bit? So uh, one great thing about being an academic advisor is that we are here to provide information, not to tell you what to do, not to be, as a mom of three kids that went to UNLV, panicked when we see these types of things, but to be able to be the person that you come to. So you make an appointment with your academic advisor and you just ask us. And Jaime and I and all the other advisors around campus um, are very happy to give you your options and to explain what that means. Because generally then you can go back to your parent or whoever you know helps pay your tuition um, and explain some of these things. So if you ever need more clarification and this presentation is a little overwhelming, then just meet with your advisor and we can really explain it in you know one on one what it means for you. But basically the question next is now that I understand a little more that probation is really an academic GPA issue. I don't get suspended after one semester, but 
that's a good warning and it is basically a warning semester um what's what's going to happen um so that's really what this slide is for is what's the impact going to be on my progress on graduating on continuing to you know be at UNLV so uh, over the minimum GPA to get any degree is a 2.0 however like Jaime said some colleges generally the stem colleges business engineering and the college of sciences and education um, as well as the college of health sciences division of health sciences majors do have higher GPA requirements than the 2.0 but in my college, um, all of the majors in uh, the College of Liberal Arts, a 2.0, you can graduate. A 1.99, you have to fix something. So that's part of our job is to be concerned about your graduation requirements, but also your progress as you, you know, as you keep going forward. So the minimum GPA is one of the issues. The other is uh, a very important part of being in college is paying for college, right? And so you will get some emails and you'll see some to do's on your um, student center task tile um, that will say SAP, meeting SAP or not meeting SAP. So SAP is this satisfactory academic progress. We just throw out acronyms, but you know, hopefully you can remember what it is. It means that financial aid is also looking at how you're doing. Because if financial aid has offered you a Pell Grant, tuition plus, at loans, et cetera, then someone else is helping pay for your education. And they don't want you just throwing it away. They want you to stay on track. And so when you see these things, meeting SAP means you have a minimum 2.0 or higher. And they also look at what they call a percentage of completion or completion rate. So if you're dropping and failing with Fs, uh, classes, then you're not completing them. And they look at the percentage of how many you are completing or passing out of how many you took. And if you're just taking grant aid and then throwing it away and dropping and failing classes, they will um, give you a warning and withhold your to, um, financial aid ability for a time. So these are the two things that typically students are concerned about, getting a degree um, and then also being able to keep your financial aid. And we have a lot of information uh, for those when you get that warning to help you navigate that. Um, some colleges, I know specifically um, the uh, Academic uh, Success Center for all exploring majors, but there are some colleges that put a registration hold on students if they fall below the university GPA. Um, and others like education put a hold on you enrolling for a future semester if you don't meet the college GPA. But they do talk to you, they do outreach, they do email you, they do call you usually. Um, and that's just to force you to go meet with an advisor and get some help so you can turn the ship around a bit. Um, so they will lift the hold once you've met with them if it's appropriate, or they will tell you what your next steps are if there's something you have to do. Um, so we tend to use registration holds to get you to wake up and come see us. Otherwise, you would just keep digging the hole a little bit deeper and taking classes maybe that were a little more difficult. Then maybe you need to go back and do something like take a class again or something. So we use those holds to force you to come in. And it's really a positive thing in the end, because once you meet with your advisor, you generally can talk through what's going on. And Jaime is going to um, talk about some of those resources as well that we usually help you with. So if you see a registration hold, don't wait until the day before you want to enroll. As soon as that appears, click on it. It'll tell you what you need to do, make an appointment with your advisor. Just call us and come in and meet with us, and we usually can help you get ready for re-enrollment with a better strategy for, for going forward. Um, and the last thing is that after one semester of being on academic probation, that is a warning semester. That's also the same for financial aid. They do give you that first semester as a warning. Um, or if you're GPB after that, warning the next semester gets to the negative 15 or worse so negative 18 etc um, then you are suspended and we'll go over that a bit too of what it means but when you are suspended that means you cannot physically uh, take classes or even online classes at UNLV for two semesters two academic fall and spring or spring and fall um, we don't mind if you go take classes somewhere else um, and transfer them so that's a strategy you might discuss with your advisor, but you wouldn't be allowed to be at UNLV without some other 
um, process like a petition. So you definitely want to talk to your advisor and come up with a good plan. I've had lots of students on suspension over the years and generally we could either petition, um, again, we'll explain that, or we could um, recommend taking which classes specifically at CSN or whatever, continue to make progress and then just transfer those in and come back in. So we'll get into the details of those a little bit, but there are some things that will happen and generally they're the things that are on this slide. So if you don't have any questions about that till now, we'll talk about those uh, in a minute. Um, again, here's some things that you can do to get off probation. Hopefully the first semester, these are things that you can explore. The right answer will always be make an appointment and talk to your advisor. That way we can sort it out because you are very different in your situation than anyone else. You're in a different major than your friends. Um, you have different reasons and different classes that you might have challenges with. So we want to handle it one on one. Um, we do have a policy that is very effective. If you fail a class, but you're doing well otherwise, and if it's a really hard class, like pre-med bio tends to be one of those, um, you will get the grade on your transcript at the end of the first semester. But we all like do-overs. Does anybody not like do-overs? <laughs> um, so the repeat grade policy is a do-over. If you take the class again, and again, your advisor can recommend that. Sometimes you have no option. It's required. So you take it again, and both grades appear on your official transcript. But once you've repeated it, the registrar will go through after the second grade and say you got a D minus or an F the first time you took bio 190. But the second time you take it, you get a B minus. So in the calculation of your grade point average, the B minus will boot out the first grade. And now you have an official B minus on your transcript GPA. Both show up, but they zero the first one out in the sense of counting it in your GPA. And that's a really effective thing because you might need just to redo one class. So, um, you know, keep your book. If you're not doing well in the class you need, hang on to it. You can't take that at another college. So you can't go repeat bio at CSN. You have to do it at UNLV, but we can explain that and go through those classes with you. Um, there's also so many reasons why students don't do well. Uh, last year and a half, we know lots and lots of weird things have happened. No one could predict that we have a pandemic and that you would have to try to switch a class uh, online, maybe a class like anatomy and physiology that should never be online. You know, you're supposed to be touching um, bones and you're supposed to be in person uh, for many things. But uh, because of all of that, we've had to uh, sort of change the way we do things. And we have many processes, but one of them is being able to talk to you about your situation and find out, did you get sick? Uh, did you get in a car accident? Did someone in your immediate family go through some crises that totally impacted your ability to do school? Um, those are hard conversations to have. However, we have them one-on-one. -on -one. We are not going to share out your situation. We just want to know, do you have a really good reason and do you have supporting documentation, i.e., I've had students that have had all kinds of interesting things, but they had the medical, maybe they're hospitalized, and they had the discharge paperwork. They had a diagnosis for a mental health issue. Um, many, many things that they could uh, provide and we could help them with what we call a petition. And um, Jaime will go into the petition a little bit more specifically of how that works, but it starts with a conversation with your advisor. So, um, you know, come in armed with information uh, and, and be ready to tell us because we want to use whatever happened to be able to help you um, remove some grades and be able to move forward and progress. Um, so another thing is when your college restricts you being able to enroll. So like I said, I used to work in the Academic Success Center. I don't know if any of you have gone through there or started out there or um, if that's where you you know, have gotten information. Um, and we used to get a lot of students that came out of pre-nursing, um, which is a very competitive degree. And also um, biology, they wanted to be a doctor and just found out they didn't like bio and math as much as, <laughs> as much as they thought. And so they really wanted to consider changing their major. So in the Academic Success Center, um, they will 
often meet with students. Uh, the advisors there are trained to know every major on campus and all of the requirements for every major on campus. And I know Jaime and I have both spent time over there, so um, we can attest that sometimes you're just trying to do something because that was what your parents wanted you to be or that's what you've always thought. But really, you took your first sociology class and you loved it. And you, you don't even know what that means for you for a future. So you could find out maybe there's a better major. Maybe there's a better fit for you. Um, maybe pre-law is still an option for law school, but just you don't have to do a specific major. So you can um, talk to your advisor about what could I do to maybe find a major that isn't so competitive, maybe that I actually enjoy more. So, you know, keep that in mind. It, you may not end up in a certain major. Most students do change about four times in a year as average or in a four-year plan. Um, we don't want you to do that. We want you to find the better fit earlier on. But again, there's so many majors on campus, you may not even realize what your options are. So talk to your advisor and we'll send you to the right advising center. Um, we have a lot of resources. And when I say free, I mean no additional cost. So if you need math tutoring, it's not going to cost you anything else. You just need your Rebel ID card. If you want to use the UNLV Writing Center, which I highly recommend because English majors that you know are really picky about editing papers and knowing punctuation and citations. So you know you come to UNLV and we ding you for not knowing how to cite something in MLA and APA and who knows all the other different ones. I don't even know half of those. Um, so we want you to have a resource and we have all of those. You just need to go visit them and most of them require an appointment. All of them have a web page. Um, we have other resources like academic coaching and you know just so many things, tutoring specific types of things, supplemental instruction and all of that you are already paying for. So we take out these nice little fees out of all of your tuition. If you look on your semester and you're like, why am I paying for that? It's so you can go use the rec center without paying more. It's so you can go to counseling and psychological services. Being a student means you have access to a lot of resources. And I think Jaime is going to touch on some of those as well. Um, one of the very biggest things that really high achieving students and students that struggle with just getting out of bed and coming and remembering they had class that day, there's a big range, is just knowing how to manage their time. And um, I know on Monday, I spoke to the graduate college, to the graduate college, the PhDs were in the room, math PhDs, people that are gonna want to teach, I don't know, some kind of really high level stuff that I don't even understand. They need help with managing their time. So that tells me that all of us also could really use help with managing our time and juggling four or five classes and a part-time or full-time job and a relationship and who knows what else all of us are doing. Um, so just uh, asking for help about how do I get all of this done? <laughs> Guess what? Your advisors have all been there. We all have uh, at least one bachelor's degree, if not more, and generally more than one master's degree. So we know what it's like, and many people that work on campus have been in your shoes. So we would want, we'd like to give you the, I wish I knew then what I know now, uh, help, and that's really managing your priorities. So um, Jaime is going to go over some uh, additional detail on those, but feel free to write down some questions, okay? So up to this point, do any of you have some questions right now? I know I have had some students who are currently taking classes at CSN and concurrently at UNLV who might not be doing so well at UNLV, but really excelling at CSN. And so they might be concerned with, what if I get on probation here, but I'm doing well over there, how do I get off of probation? Yeah, so that's a definitely a good question. Um, if a student is doing well over at CSN, that's definitely great. We want that to definitely go and continue. But if the student's also taking classes at UNLV and not doing well, it could be possible that um, if the student stays in the class, doesn't earn um, well enough grades and ends up on one of those type of probations, that would begin for the spring semester. Uh, and if the student were to stay in classes at UNLV, they would continue on probation. The classes at CSN would not raise your grades or anything for here. 
Um, but the only way to improve that would be to either retake classes that you didn't do so well in or to try to take different courses and do well and excel in those classes here. There is the deadline of, of October 29th. Um, we've been telling students October 28th just because the 29th is Nevada Day. It's a Friday and all the offices are going to be closed. But that is the last day to audit or withdraw from a class before you get a grade for it. Now, before I even finish that statement, it's important to know if you are receiving any financial aid or scholarships, check with the financial aid office first if you are thinking of dropping or withdrawing from a class because that may impact your ability to receive financial aid in future semesters. But if you talk to them, you think about it, you also talk with an advisor and you decide, yeah, it's in my best interest to withdraw from a class before the 28th of October so you don't get a bad grade, then you can go ahead and do that through your MyUNLV. Now with that, does anyone know the difference between audit or withdraw or dropping a class? See some head nods. Um, so withdrawing from a class means you are dropping that class from being enrolled. That means you're not going to go ahead and get a grade for that class, um, but you don't get any money back either for that class. You've already paid for it, and on your transcript, you're going to get a W. Um, if you audit from a class, um, that gives you the ability for you to continue to stay in the class, to learn the material and content, so that way if you plan on retaking it the following semester, you are better prepared to kind of excel that following semester since you've learned the material for the first time around. That one you'll also get an AD on your transcript. So those are the difference between the two. And yeah, good question. Any other questions right now? Okay, so there's definitely options if you do end up going on probation. Um, that's an important part that I learned through myself when I went on academic probation, when I was getting my bachelor's degree, there are options that you can consider. Now, we know you all our students aren't going to know everything, and that's okay. I did it when I was a student. But the important part that can help you is to seek out options and to seek resources to help get information. So one of them is to go and appeal is to do a financial aid appeal um, for your SAP, which is your satisfactory academic progress, where if you go on probation, um, on academic probation, where your UNLV GPA is below a 2.0, you will get a notification that your SAP is warning on your MyUNLV. What that basically means is that you're on probation, you're going to get conditional financial aid for that extra semester, but if you don't increase your GPA or your completion rate to the requirements, then there is the possibility you can lose financial aid. However, you can always either earn it back or you can try to submit an appeal with the financial aid office to try to earn your ability to get the financial aid scholarships, loans, grants back um, through an appeal. The other option that is available is a late withdrawal appeal. So let's say, for example, this past spring semester, you were taking classes and you just had something very bad happen, traumatic, you have documentation, sometimes you don't need to, but you can work with your advisors to submit a late withdrawal appeal, where what you can do is ask for that whole semester to remove, be removed from your transcript based on extenuating circumstances and valid reasoning. So if, say, you failed all your classes in a semester, but it was kind of not your fault, um, it was more like, you know, there's kind of like live situation things that come up, you can work with your advisor to help submit a late withdrawal appeal, and there is a possibility that those grades can get removed, which can then help out increase your GPA. The other important element is if for some reason you do end up getting suspended from UNLV, as Debbie was mentioning, you could do an early reinstatement appeal where instead of sitting out for one full calendar um, or academic year of fall and spring or spring and fall, you can sit out either one semester or once you get suspended, you can say, look, I had some extenuating circumstances. Is there a way I can get another semester of being on probation? So working with your advisors can definitely help with the late withdrawal pill and your early reinstatement appeal. The financial aid appeal would be something you would check in with, um, with the financial aid office. 
Now, there are also various support services you can use on campus. Um, so these are different departments that are part of your tuition and fees that you pay for. Uh, one of them is academic success coaching, where what you can do is you can partner with a graduate student here at UNLV to help develop skills and strategies to kind of help you rebound, to better assess your time management, to help you with planning, to help you with learning strategies. That way it helps you navigate your semester and what you're experiencing. You could do like weekly visits, you do monthly visits with your academic success coach and they are doing it virtually or in person. So there's some options and they do have some workshops that they have each semester. Uh, student counseling and psychological services or CAPS, they have a lot of different resources that go to help out students in case you're having any mental health concerns or just you need someone to talk to. They're very awesome. Um, I know a lot of people who work in that office. They're very helpful, very student-centered, and they really want to make sure that ultimately your well-being is being taken care of because first and foremost, we know you're a human being and we want to make sure that you are doing well with that. College, everything else, we can align those in order, but CAPS can definitely help to make sure that you're doing well with yourself. Um, and if you're thinking of down the road of like looking for jobs, internships, there is the ability with career services where they can help you out too with trying to see maybe if you're unsure of what major you want to do. They can help out with like different skill assessments, help you with building your resume and looking for jobs both on and off campus in case that's something you're looking to do. But as we said, we cannot stress it enough. I think we may have said it like 20 times or more connect with an academic advisor. Um, we are here, we are, we love what we do, um, and we continue to be stay updated with resources and options to help you with different departments. So as always, connect with an advisor so that way we can help you out. Well, let's go. Speaking of probation, uh, we definitely want to make sure that we have time for you for Q&A, for kind of seeing what questions you have or even anything academic advising related. Uh, but what questions do you all have? So I have a general question that my students in my class have asked. And so I always stress that they meet with their academic advisor and make a, a strategic contingency plan. So if things may not be going well, and particularly now that financial aid paperwork, you know, the new financial aid is opening, should they go ahead and add like CSN to the schools on their list so that, you know, if they do have to end up going to CSN in the spring, that at least their financial, well, next year, at least their financial aid package has that information on there, or should they start preparing to have to maybe pay for those courses out of pocket? Hmm. You mean if someone were to transfer and end up just going to CSN or if they just take a class there? Either or, because I've had both situations. Okay, Jaime, do you want to answer that? Because I think that really the question is where they're primarily a student and if they even have SAP. Yeah, so that's a good question. So SAP, Satisfactory Academic Progress, um, say that only is related to the institution that you're at. So say you're here at UNLV, you're not doing as well as you thought, um, and you're afraid you might go on probation for next spring or next year. When you fill out your FAFSA, which it just came out on October 1st, you can list up to 10 institutions. So if you're from here in Las Vegas area, you can put UNLV, CSN, Nevada State. Um, you could even put schools outside of Las Vegas in case you're from out of state and you're like, yeah, I'm from the LA area. I need to put like some of the Cal schools or UC schools. That's perfectly okay. What happens is all of those schools are going to get your FAFSA and the information. Um, if you're admitted there, then what they will do is they'll send you your financial aid award, but your financial aid will only be able to go to one college or university. Now, there are some co-enrollment forms, like say we have one at UNLV where you can connect it with CSN. So if you take half your classes here, half there, you fill it out. So that way your aid gets to pay appropriately on that amount. Now, I'm some years removed from financial aid, so don't quote me on those. It's just general information. 
Um, but definitely check with the financial aid office. And yes, for your FAFSA, if you're not sure what you're thinking next year, you can put anywhere. Even the FAFSA you did for this 2021 to next spring 2022 year, like say you did it last October, you can always go in and revise it and be like, you know what, next semester, I think I'm going to go to CSN. You can go in there, revise it, add CSN, and that'll get sent to them. So that way, if you do enroll in classes in CSN for the spring, at least you'll have your financial aid information over there already and you'll just need to work with say CSN's financial aid office on discussing that award. Right and, and the other issue is that if you're not doing well here and you're dropping and failing classes that does affect your completion rate everywhere. So your um, FAFSA is federal it's the federal department of education and so if you have a uh, not done so hot here you may have lost your financial aid everywhere in the sense of you're below 70 percent so every institution will see your records because you'll need to send your transcripts to any schools you get admitted to um, however sometimes students just do that during the summer and they don't have financial aid they pay out of pocket at csn things like that so so really the question is more of the reasons why you would want to you know are you really transferring or are you just trying to pick up a couple of classes somewhere else because your UNLV, um, if you're a student here and this is where you plan to graduate, it's it's something we would want to help you fix things here. Um, you know, because you may not you may not have SAP here, which means you may not have financial aid here. You might not have it anywhere. So um, so definitely talk to your advisor about why you would do all these things so we can help you. And like Kelly said, if you're going to be changing schools because you're just not happy being here, you're not quite ready for a four-year research institution and you feel like you want to do an associate's degree, we can still help you. I mean, I tell students, just because you're not here for a semester, you're still my student. You can still email me. We can still have advising. Like, I'm, I'm looking for the long term. I know eventually you're not graduating from CSN with a bachelor's degree. In, in most cases, they only have a couple degrees. But if you're my student, you're my student, I don't care where you are. And so I would still wanna give you good advice about what you're doing wherever you are, if your plan is to come back or finish up here. So, so yeah, so talk to your advisor, even if you think you don't need any advising, we could probably help you out. Beautiful, thank you both so much. Absolutely. And within the chat box, I'm putting the link for advising. So that way, what you were able to do is go ahead and look at that. Um, so that's going to be a resource that you have um, as far as you can go and look for what your major is and which specific advising center you belong to. Then any other questions before I transition to talk about SU grading? Okay. So I'm also going to send another link as well to um, this is information for students. Um, if you scroll down to where it says satisfactory and satisfactory grading option, this is going to be for this fall 2021 semester. Um, what will happen is there's specific grading criteria where you can change a class from a letter grade to satisfactory and satisfactory grading um, for this semester. Now, SU grading does not go to impact your GPA. It goes to show that you completed a class. Now, the biggest different part is, though, is if you do get a C grade or better, um, then you can change it to a satisfactory grade. Um, but if you get a C minus or lower and you try to change it to the SU grading, you're going to get an unsatisfactory. Regardless, though, it won't impact your GPA, um, but there are some specific programs that won't allow you to do SU grading, such as like if you're in the pre-nursing program or even like pre-social work or social work, those ones, there's some classes or you won't be able to change to SU grading. But if you're in any of the other majors, you would have that option. Say if you're like, you know, I really don't want to get a C on my transcript. I'd rather get like an SU or an S, then you can go and um, apply for that at the very end of the semester once your final grade posts. So um, it'll become available to students starting on Wednesday, uh, December 15th. So. And I know our advising center, I'm assuming the other advising centers have a similar thing. We do drop in which means no appointment advising um, that you, and we do it by phone because 
we don't want anyone to have to come here for a quick question. And also, you know, we're trying to keep people moving. Um, so we do drop in advising after final grades come out. As far as we know, it's only going to be this last semester um, that you will be able to make these changes. But um, you can just call during that time once your final grades posted and discuss individually, like, how's this going to help me get into law school? Is it a bad idea for me to change this grade? How will it affect my millennium? Because we will be very concerned about if you don't have the 12 credits. Um, if you get a U, then you might drop down to nine credits. If you get a S, it might be okay, but we're looking at your overall GPA for the semester as well. So you can talk about that one-on-one -on -one before you push that button and irreversibly change your grade because it can't change back. Um, so take advantage of that uh, once you have your grade so we can talk you through it one by one. Uh, I noticed uh, that students last semester didn't really call for advising. They just change their grades and we hope it worked out okay <laughs> but um, but if you talk to us we will put notes and we will look up these things so definitely don't not get advising because you see a bad grade the bad grade might be a completion grade that you want to keep and then you just retake the class and get a higher grade next semester so so we want to help you with that um, sometimes having a lot of information makes helps you make the decision and then you're fine and then you know it's okay so anybody have any questions about those kinds of things that happened last semester if you were here? Come on guys, this is your chance to get your questions answered. I have a question um, about the SU grades and um, thank you guys. I'm sorry I couldn't be here when you all first started off, but uh, glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, and you might have covered this before, so for, forgive me if, if uh, you did. So, so if a student, like last semester, or so that would have been last spring or last fall, right, opted not, or for whatever reasons, did not opt into the SU grade, is it possible for them to go back and, and opt into for the SU grade? No. Like retroactively? No. So, okay, so, so it's done for each semester. Yeah, there was a deadline. Uh, okay. And it was a generous about three weeks, maybe, uh, almost three week period where we were sitting by the phones waiting to advise students for drop in advising. Okay. So any student who didn't do it then doesn't have that option now. Okay. And I think it's partly a registrar thing. They have to have a sure. cutoff date. Um, however, that doesn't mean the student can't petition through the faculty senate, you know, for a great withdrawal, um, a late withdrawal. And it doesn't mean that they can't uh, retake a class to do the repeat policy where they could get a higher grade and then replace the GPA calculation. So they still have options, but the SU has got to be cut off um, each semester. And again, we don't know if we're going to have it past this semester. So sure. So once they don't make that uh, decision, they still can talk to us and see what their other options are. Okay, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. I was also gonna mention as well too, students can also talk to us anytime. We are in our offices or we work remotely over winter break and over summer, believe it or not. Sometimes we get that question a lot. I have some <laughs> students that are sometimes like, are you working over the summer? I'm like, yes, we are. We enjoy what we do. It's a year round position. <laughs> so we are here. And we do answer emails too. And every center has a main email on the advising page. So if you just want to email the center, especially if your advisor happens to get a vacation, which hopefully we all will at some point, <laughs> um, you can always reach someone in advising. Um, there's always going to be someone available because we, you know, we work year round, just like you all take classes year round. Beautiful. Well, if none of our students here have any questions, I guess that wraps up our session for today. Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you so much, Jaime and Debbie. As always, it's a pleasure to see you and have you answer all of our questions and provide such thorough information for our students. We can tell that you really love what you do because you always say yes to us and answer <laughs> everything that we have. We are very, very grateful that you're part of our team and that you're with us today. So with that, I'd like to close out our session. Um, thank you all for attending. 
Uh, we have been recording, so this recording will be available on our YouTube page for any of you students who have an, a question or thought you heard something, and um, they will share our power, their PowerPoint with us, which will be available to you as well for uh, resources and references. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great and warm and safe weekend. Try not to get wet out there. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank everyone. You.